<laughs> Good morning. It's great to be in the Lord's house this morning. Amen. A <laughs> um, couple announcements before we get started this morning. Um, Oak Hill Student Ministries Talent Show has been moved to January of 2023. Um, the exact date is in the works. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been moved to January. December's just really crazy. There's a lot going on. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't want to add one more thing to the mix. Um, the Hoboken Parade is Saturday, December 10th. All participants are to meet up at Hoboken Baptist at 515 for the parade lineup. If you have any questions, please see Miss Brittany Herndon. Um, the greening of the church is on December 4th. Um, kids need to be at the church at five, dressed in Christmas colors. Uh, the following services that night there will be cake. Sorry, following services that night there will be cake and punch with a hayride to follow. December fourth. That's today. Great. All right. So five tonight. Kids need to be dressed in Christmas colors. All right. Um. Pajama night and the pajama night and the Christmas story. Is that what is that what we're calling it? Okay. Uh, it's December 18th at 6. Uh, the ladies will be bringing soup and sandwiches to serve afterwards. Uh, so, yeah, y'all please be with us on December 18th. Um, last announcement. Um, anyone having an issue or concern regarding the cleaning of the church? Uh, Miss Vicki Riggins is in charge of the older portion of the church so that's the social hall um, the youth room and those classrooms in the back um, and Miss Cindy Carter is in charge of the newer part so that's the sanctuary and these nursery classrooms uh, please see one of these ladies if you have a need or a concern um, any other announcements all right uh, any prayer requests this morning Yes, sir. Who said that? All right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Any other prayer requests? Terry Hardy. Any others? All right. Well, if there aren't any other prayer requests, um, let's open up in a word of prayer and get started. Lord, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, just bringing us into your house this morning. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, Lord, we're just so grateful uh, for the opportunity to gather uh, to worship you. Um, Lord, we just pray that uh, everything that takes place in this service today would, would be honoring and, and glorifying to you. Um, God, and that you would just you would get all the glory. And um, that we would just love you this morning uh, and worship you the way that you deserve to be worshipped. Um, we thank you for everything that you're doing in this church, everything uh, that you're going to do. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you would, please stand and uh, shake hands just for a minute. <laughs>
you would please remain standing as we worship. i 
Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are indeed amazed at your amazing grace that you show us each and every day, Lord, and your mercy and your kindness that you uh, give to us each and every day of our lives, Lord. We are so unworthy of even one of your blessings, Lord. We thank you for this uh, praise and worship we've heard today, Lord. We thank you for your word we're about to receive, Lord. I pray that we would listen to it and uh, heed your word and, and be that. Christian witness that we need to be to this lost and dying world. Lord, we come to a part of the service where we give back a small portion of what you blessed us with in the way of the tithe and the offering. So I ask that you bless it, bless the giver, Lord. And Lord, we just honor and praise your holy name through it all in Christ's name. Amen.
now for he alone is worthy Good morning. If I put it, I was going to lay it up on top there. You're good. I didn't want to lose it. Well, this morning, you can open your Bibles to the, to the book of Acts, Acts 9. I don't have a Christmas message this morning. I know we've entered into the Christmas season, but I'm going to save those for Brother Ray. He can preach the Christmas messages. As the pastor, I know he's probably got a, a series of, of sermons laid out already, I'm sure. And on top of that, most importantly, that's not where God led me, so there we go. We're in Acts chapter 9 this morning. Acts chapter 9, go to verse 36. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. The title of the sermon this morning will be Death to Life. Is your life impacting others? Now, you could probably come up with a better sermon title than I have, but that's the one I came up with. Death to Life. Is your life impacting others? I assume everyone is there. I hear all the page rustling has, the rustling has stopped. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Vance Cawley. Um, very honored to be here this morning to fill in for Brother Ray. Now... Verse 36, chapter 9, tells us this. Says, now there was a, at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom they had washed, or excuse me, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him uh, turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that, the, that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, as we bow before you today, Lord, we're so thankful to be in your house. We're thankful for your word and, God, how it has spoken into our lives this morning. And, Lord, I pray that you will, you will help me this morning, God, to convey your message to your church. And, Lord, I pray I wouldn't say anything other than what you would have said. I pray you would bless the reading of your word. And, God, we're also very confident in knowing that you don't need us to say anything. That, Lord, you have... You're all powerful. Your word is powerful. We believe it's the living word. And God, we can read it and sit down and allow the Holy Spirit to work, and he would. But this morning, God, for whatever reason, you have chosen to use me uh, to expound on a few verses. And I pray that you would help us to do just that. I pray that every heart in here, Lord, mine first, would be open to what you have to say. And I pray that we would hear your word. We wouldn't just hear it, but, Lord, we would apply it. And I pray that we would be changed people when we walk out of here this morning. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, 
I do have four points this morning, but you'll be encouraged to know there are four very quick points, okay? So we're going to move pretty fast here. It's not going to be a long, drawn-out sermon. But as an introduction here, you, we're looking here, and we're at a place called Joppa. Now, you've probably heard of Joppa before. It's been in other places in Scripture. Probably the most famous place was over in the book of Jonah. If you've read in the book of Jonah lately, of uh, chapter 1, verse 3, you will see where it says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So you're probably familiar with the place Joppa. You've heard that place before. And so this morning in, in today's sermon, what we're going to do is we're going to look here about this location, but there was a person there named Tabitha. Now, she fell ill, she died. We're going we're gonna to compare this morning her physical death and our spiritual death, okay? We're not, for one minute this morning, trying to imply, if you're listening and going, well, wait a minute, Brother Vance, she was a believer. The Bible says she was a disciple. She was. So we're not trying to say she was an unbeliever and she became a believer. We're not saying that at all. We're going to look here at her physical death and our spiritual death, okay? We're going to look at the physical transformation that, we, that she went through when Peter brought her back to life, we're going to compare that to our spiritual transformation. Because listen, if you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have undergone a spiritual transformation, or at least I hope you have. And so we're going to be hitting on the church today a little bit. We're going to be talking to Christians. But we're also going to be talking about something that if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I pray you pay attention because we got something for you too. Don't want to leave anybody out, okay? This is full service today. You get it all. Now, as we jump here into the verses, let's just, um, let's just go ahead and get right into verse 37 here. Now, we know that verse 36 told us that there was a, a person, a lady named jo a Tabitha, who was there at Joppa. She died, okay? And it says in verse 37, a little bit more, it says, And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, who when they had washed... They laid her in an upper chamber. Okay, again, there's nothing, nothing fancy about what we're going to say this morning, but I do pray that you pay attention. And, and notice some key words here in what is being said. It says that she became sick and she died. It says that they also washed her body as it was customary to do this, that they washed her body, they prepared it for burial, basically. They washed the body and they laid it uh, in an upper chamber or an upper room is what they done. And so they put it there. Now, I don't want to sound morbid this morning, but I do want to say this to make a point. No matter how much you wash the outside of a dead body, it does not change the, the status of the inside of that body. Amen? No matter how much you wash it, it's still dead on the inside. And I'm not trying to be morbid or, or vulgar sounding this morning. I'm just saying that a dead body is a dead body, and on the inside it's dead too. Now, we can take that physical emphasis there, and we can bring it over to a spiritual side too. Now, notice this right here. If you remember Jesus over in the Gospels in Matthew 23, 27, he was speaking to scribes and Pharisees. And they come up there in all their religious garb, and they were talking to Jesus. And they were, they were just spewing out religious lar uh, jargon there, whatever you want to call it. They were just spewing it out. Remember what Jesus said? He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, is what he called them. He said, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but inside all are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. What he was telling the Pharisees and the scribes is you guys look great on the outside, but on the inside, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You have nothing to offer to God except that you look good. Now, as we think about that this morning, again, no matter how much we try to wash outside of a dead body, and although we do that in preparation for burial, the inside is still dead. And you know what? I, I was thinking about that this week, and, and in times past, I preached this sermon probably two or three years ago, and I was recalling as I was reviewing back over it yesterday about the last time I preached this. But, you know, as we take the physical death here of Tabitha and we see the preparation of the body, we can bring that over to a spiritual sense and bring it into the church. And I wonder just how many people might be sitting in here this morning that don't know Jesus Christ, but they've made the outside look really, really good. And they've impressed a lot of people. 
Now you say, Brother Vance, well listen, I believe church is one of the biggest mission fields that we have in Southeast Georgia. I don't know about the rest of the world, but there's a lot of people sitting. Listen, I'll go ahead and say it. Some of the meanest people, some of the meanest people I've ever encountered in my life have been in church. And I don't understand that because if there's been a transformation on the inside, there's got to be a transformation on the outside. But the problem is we are trying to clean up the outside with no regard to the inside. Now I was reading my Bible this week and, and um, at lunch and I was reading over there where um, Jesus had encountered this Samaritan woman and Jesus began to ask her questions in the process. He told her so much about herself. She becomes a believer. She goes back into town. She's telling the people that she had met the Messiah. And I like what she said. And I underlined this in my Bible. She says, come see a man or come meet a man who knew everything about me. And man, I just pondered on that for a while. I just leaned back and I thought, that's a scary thought. Yeah. You know, I hear people say this all the time in church. Well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. Right. That's scary to me because I can fool a lot of people. But I can't fool God, and you can't either. God knows everything about us. So I say that to say this in love this morning. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, please know that no matter how much you fool Brother Ray, no matter how much you fool your Sunday school teacher or all the deacons or the worship leader or whoever, Jesus looks right down through all of that and says, I see your heart. I see your heart. And I say that in love because, listen, I would not want you to live your whole life more worried about what everybody in this building thought than what Jesus thought. Because as sure as I stand on this stage, we're all going to, we're all going to stand before him one day. And we will give an account of what we have done and, and what we've done with Jesus. And the only thing that's going to matter when we get to heaven is what we did with Jesus. We're not going to be able to say, but God, man, I, I, I... And you guys did an awesome job this morning worship. I, I really loved it. But, you know, but even they won't be able to say, but God, I, I led worship for you. I won't be able to say, God, I, I preach sermons for you. Don't matter. Doesn't matter. It don't matter if you've been to 25 countries on mission trips. Won't matter. You've just done a lot of good stuff. The good stuff won't get you to heaven. Amen. Only Jesus will get you to heaven. And we see here, and, and I just jotted a few things down in my notes here. I typed these notes up a long time ago, and I've gone, but I'll, every time I preach, I add stuff to my notes and but I, and I, just, I just jotted a few things down here about how we do try to look a certain way on the outside, how we come in, how we try to talk the church talk, how we try to wear the certain outfits, how we, how we uh, try to accomplish a lot of things. As a matter of fact, I was standing on the front row while ago listening to you guys leading worship, and I thought about this passage, and, 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 uh, and I said four quick points, but it's growing as I'm standing here, okay? So, so uh, it's a good thing we started at 1030. I might have you out by 12. But... But as I look here, I, I preached this sermon the other day, and I was pondering uh, that in my mind while ago as I was standing there. I thought about John chapter 3. Now, John chapter 3, as we see here, I'm not going to read you the chapter. I'm just going to read you about two verses. But John 3, 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, notice this right here. Let me pause just for a second. John is the one writing this gospel, okay? He was the beloved disciple, the beloved disciple. He was the youngest, or they thought to be the youngest. He refers to himself as the one Jesus loved. He's the one writing this down. But notice what he writes. A man, he said, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. In other words, when, when, when uh, Nicodemus showed up that night to talk to Jesus, John would have been impressed with Nicodemus. Everybody in Jerusalem probably knew who Nicodemus was because he was a Pharisee. He was also rich. He was powerful. He was important. People knew who he was. When he showed up at the door that night, he wanted to talk to Jesus. They opened the door. There stood Nicodemus. They were all like, oh, it's Nicodemus. What's he doing here? And they were all like, they, they were like, they all probably went and sat down and just stared at him like, it's, he's one of the rulers of the Jews. He comes in. I believe that's why John put in his gospel, he was a Pharisee. He was named Nicodemus. He was, one of the, he was a ruler of the Jews. John probably wrote that down because he was impressed by it. But here's the catcher. I love this. But in the process of all of this, and he looks, and, and, and Nicodemus says to Jesus, 
We know that you're a rabbi. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles except he be from God. And so Nicodemus is kind of throwing some praise to Jesus, probably wanting a little praise in return. We do that, don't we? As people, don't we do that? Hey, man, I've heard about all the good stuff you're going on. And really what we're wanting to do is people to ask us what's going on in our lives so we can brag on what's going on. And so Nicodemus is throwing this at Jesus. Notice what Jesus did. Jesus did one moment say, yeah, I've heard of you too. You're Nicodemus. Wow, man, you're a ruler. None of that. He went right to this. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. So here's, the, here's what I want you to get. In all of that, Jesus didn't even acknowledge who Nicodemus was. Oh, he knew who he was, but he didn't acknowledge it. And we could look at that and say, why would he not have done that? Why would he not have said, hey, Nicodemus, I, I know who you are. Man, you've done some good stuff. You know why he didn't acknowledge the good stuff? Because in the world Jesus lives in, that good stuff don't mean anything. He didn't want to get, I believe it all my heart, he did not want to give Nicodemus the wrong idea and make him think that, okay, all of your good stuff has gained God's attention. Because he wanted Nicodemus to understand, in all of your good stuff, in all of your church attendance, in all of your sacrifices, and all of these things that you've done, listen, apart from knowing me as your personal Savior, it's not going to get you there. Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's good stuff. I think we need to be weary of that this morning, or leery of that, not weary, but leery of it. And I'm kind of weary of it, to be honest with you. But we need to be leery of it. Now, point two, the deliverance of Tabitha. Now, notice here in verse 40. I'm just going to jump on down because I am going a little longer than I meant to. We're just going to cut right to the chase. But the deliverance says in verse 40, but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down, and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, we want to see the deliverance here. The Bible says that when Peter knelt down and prayed, when he turned to the body and said, arise, that she opened her eyes, and she sat up. Now, Tabitha was delivered. You say, well, what was she delivered from? Well, the Bible says that she was delivered from her state of being dead by Peter praying over her to being alive. Now, we know that Peter really didn't have anything to do with her coming back to life, okay? Even his prayer wasn't supernatural, but the one he prayed to was supernatural, okay? So it was the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus through Peter there that was able to bring her back to life. Now, and again, let's just bring it over to the spiritual emphasis side this morning. I, I act kind of wound tight when I get up here because I have a reason to act wound tight. Listen, I was once dead too. Amen? Some of y'all still dead, okay? Because y'all ain't happy to be here today. You got to smile. Act like you've been saved from something, okay? But listen, I was once dead in my trespasses and sin, but thanks be to God, the grace we sung about a while ago, listen, I praise Him because I don't deserve salvation. I know y'all have heard this once, at least maybe 100,000 times, and I've quoted Brother Ray 100,000 times myself. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. I have salvation today because of what he did in my life, not because of what I did. The supernatural power that raised Tabitha from the dead is the same supernatural power that raised me from the dead, spiritually speaking. I was dead in my trespasses and my sins. I was dirty. I was unholy. I was undone full of bad habits, and you know what? Jesus saved me. I didn't have to get everything right when I came to Jesus. I came to Jesus like I was, filth, dirt, and all, and said, Jesus, here, I'm giving it all to you. Why? Because that's how he wants us. Amen. He wants us like that. And there might be somebody sitting here this morning saying, hey, when I get it all together, when I, when I get this here fixed or I get this habit out of my life, man, I'm coming to Jesus. You'll never get there. Right. You'll never get there because you can't do anything uh, it's, you don't have power to, to clean it all up. You don't. Jesus cleaned me up. And listen, <laughs> please hear me. I'm still a mess. Anybody else? Yes. I'm a sinner saved by grace who still struggles every day. Yes. And probably the biggest thing I struggle with is temper. Anybody else struggle with temper? Yes. Man, and, and we sat at a basketball game the other night, and I love sports, but sports are the devil. If you got kids playing, you know what I'm talking about. 
So, you know, we sit at ball games, and I, and I say this because I, I can look back over my life and just realize that, you know, sometimes we can get so bent out of shape, and, and we may not say anything to anybody. I didn't say anything to anybody, but in my spirit, I just felt angry because, you know, things didn't go the way I thought they should have gone. And then I walk out of that ball game, and even though I didn't say a word to anybody and I didn't grumble to anybody, I just kept my grumbling to myself and Connie. Um, and, and, you know, and, but I just felt so dirty on the inside. And I thought, Lord, why am I getting so bent out of shape over a ball game? It got nothing to do with eternity. Absolutely nothing. And sometimes I let myself get all worked up, and I'm going, and when I get worked up, it just, it just robs me of all the joy that I have in my life of my walk with God. It don't solve anything. I'll go to bed mad. I won't sleep good. I get up mad. And, it just, but, and that's, I say that about sports. We all have something that we struggle with. And we just get worked up on the inside. Listen, Jesus saved us from all of that, but we're still a work in progress. And you know what? He'll be working on me to the day I die. Amen. I'll never... I'll never, ever get it all worked out. But I am going to tell you this. I, I, I did, I'm in my second year of teaching school. And man, that'll challenge your faith. But anyway, but I, I sit every day at lunch and I read my Bible. And the other day, one of the teachers walked in and, uh, and they said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your Bible reading. I said, no, I just sit in the quiet and I read my Bible and I, I pray for my students and, and uh, pray for us and, and I eat my lunch and... And I told her, I said, you know what, if I didn't spend time with God like this, I said, I'm not bragging on me. I said, I'm bragging on God. I said, I need God in my life yeah. to keep me going in the right direction. And church, we do, okay? We, we might be saved, but we, we don't just get saved and move on, okay? And listen, I'm going to say this here. This is extra. But if you got saved so you won't go to hell, that's a bad reason to get saved. Now, I, listen, I don't want to go to hell either, Okay? But honestly, the night I got saved, hell wasn't even in my concept. I just felt God showing me that, Vance, you're lost, and you're eat up with sin, but I want to help you with that. You know, I died on the cross for you. Nothing can, can cover those sins except my blood. That's what I heard. And so I went forward and got saved. But listen, the beauty, and I think we're missing this as Christians today, the beautiful part about being a Christian is I have somebody to walk with me every day through this difficult life. Jesus loved me so much that he didn't save me and leave me alone. He saved me and gave me the Holy Spirit of God, which is part of the Godhead Trinity. He's not a it, he's a he. He lives in me. And you know what? He not only gave the Holy Spirit to convict me when I do wrong, to comfort me when I'm struggling, to help me pray when I can't muster up the words to pray because I don't know what to pray. All I can do is cry. The Bible says the Holy Spirit intercedes on my behalf. But even better than that, he gave the Holy Spirit to me as a sealment. Is that even a word, sealment? I may have just created a new word. He sealed me with the Holy Spirit of God as a promise. You know what that promise is? He's coming back to get me. Amen. Man, I'm so glad about that because I don't want to stay here forever. It's getting worse every day. I'm waiting for that day. I can't wait for him to come back and get me. And you listen, you say, Brother Vance, are you, are you one of those that thinks that God's... Yeah, I do. And I think that's what's so beautiful about the Bible is when we look back through the Old Testament... We see God make promises, he fulfilled them. God made promises, he fulfilled them. He made promises, he fulfilled them. The only fulfillment he, uh, the only promise he hadn't fulfilled yet is the return, his return to rapture out the church. But if he made promises all the way through the Bible that he fulfilled, why in the world would I think he wouldn't fulfill that one? He's not a liar. He's the God of his word. And I know he's coming back, with, coming back for me one day and the Holy Spirit of God has confirmed that in my life. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, he wants you just like you are. And he can raise you from death to life. I share that as a personal testimony. Third point, moving quickly here. Notice the difference of Tabitha. Verse 41 says, And he gave her his hand. This is Tabitha and Peter here. She gave her hand to him, and he lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows... Presented her alive. Now, to me, this is one of the most important verses in this passage and the most important point. But I want you to notice the difference. He presented her alive. 
There was a difference in Tabitha after Peter raised her from the dead. Now you're saying right then, Brother Vance, I don't see where it says anything about a difference. Are you telling me she acted different? I thought she said she was a disciple already, which means she was already a believer. Oh, she was. You know what the difference was? She was dead, and then she was alive. You can't get any more different than that. Amen. Amen. One minute she's laying over here, however they had her laid out. Man, there is no life in her at all. There's no movement. She's not getting up, walking around. She's not talking to people. She's just there. But when Peter prayed over her, God touched her, brought her back to life. Oh, that's a difference. When somebody goes from dead to life, we ought to expect that difference. Y'all know where I'm going here, right? Y'all connecting the dots already. Well, here's the deal. Okay, if there was a physical difference between being dead and alive, if you are a Christian this morning, you've been saved by the grace of God, His blood covers you, not just, as Peter writes over there and even in Hebrews, not just anything saved you, the precious blood of Jesus Christ saved you. Amen. Then shouldn't there be a difference? Yes. Now, we just said in the last point that we all struggle. Yes, we do. But there ought to be a noticeable difference in your life. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're not going to have a bad moment from time to time. But honestly, when you have that bad moment, it ought to convict you and break your heart because you didn't just sin against somebody. You sinned against your Savior. It ought to eat you up inside until you can't stay like that. So there was a difference here. Listen, she acted different. She was moving now. She wasn't moving earlier. She talked different. She looked different. Why? Because she went from death to life. Church, when we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, we ought to talk different. We ought to act different. We ought to treat other people different. There should be a difference about us. The only problem I'm finding today with us as Christians in His church, God's church, is that we don't look different. We look like the world. Now, that's offensive, but it's the truth. We look like the world. We look like everybody else. If we're wanting to impact the world for Jesus Christ, there's got to be a difference. There has to be. There has to be a difference. We shouldn't cuss like the lost world cusses. We shouldn't dress in provocative clothing like the lost world dresses. We shouldn't, and I'm just going to say it, we shouldn't be out bar hopping on Friday nights and Saturday nights and then show up on church on Sunday morning and want to sing praises to God. Those things just don't mix. They don't mix. But that's where we're at today in church. There's got to be a difference. I'm not going to lie to y'all, being a Christian is one of the hardest things I've ever done because I have to be constantly monitoring everything that comes out of my mouth. Constantly monitoring every way that I act or how I treat other people. I came out of the bathroom a while ago, and I'll just give you a fine example. I don't even remember who... There you start there. I don't remember what your name is. Forgive me. But I came out of the bathroom... And uh, when I first got here and I'd wash my hands and I, you know, like most people, I grabbed a water napkins and I dried them and threw them in the trash can, but I didn't get all the water off. And so I come out, I'm going, trying to dry them. And then I got to talking to this gentleman in the foyer. And then I walked off and I felt bad because I didn't shake his hand. And it bothered me and I had to go back to him and say, look, I'm sorry I didn't shake your hand, but my hands were wet and I didn't want, you know, just... But the, but the thing is, is, you know, the harder I try to live for Jesus, the more I'm concerned about what everybody thinks. I can't make everybody happy. And there's certain people I'm going to offend, and I'm okay with that, okay? There's certain people I don't mind if I offend you, if I'm offending you for the right reason. But if I offend you because I was just being negligent or a knucklehead, that bothers me. Because I don't want people, because when people judge me, they judge Jesus. And I've got to be careful of what comes out of my mouth and how I act. Every day. And you know how we do that? We take Jesus with us everywhere we go. I've been in that situation before. Listen, I've been in that situation, and some of y'all may be there now, where when you get up here in a few moments to go back out those doors, you're going to hang Jesus up on an on a imaginary door hanger or a coat hanger right there by the door. And you'll pick him up again next Sunday when you come back through. Amen or oh me. 
Oh, I've done that. And you'll do it too if you're not careful. We'll start separating our life from our Christianity. It should be so intertwined you cannot separate the two. Jesus should go with you everywhere you go. Because listen, here's the deal. If you're a Christian, you can't take him off. You cannot take him off. Point four, and I'm done. This is a very short point. It says in verse 42, And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. Now, verse 42 is very simple and right to the point. It says, because of what happened there in Joppa, the fact that Tabitha was dead, had been brought back to life, that people went out and started talking about it, started, started telling the account about how they saw her get up. They walked out of the room she was dead. She walked out of the room she was alive. I mean, listen, that will get some talking going on. And people were like just blown away. But because of what had happened in the life of Tabitha, it says that many believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Many became believers. Now, I sat and pondered on that verse a lot, and I thought, you know, I don't want to make it say something that it's not saying. I don't want to do that at all. But, you know, I have to say this. If as many people acted like Christians that proclaimed to be Christians, wouldn't we be making a difference in our community? Now let that sink in just for a moment because I know a lot of people that profess to be Christians and I'm not judging this morning. I'm just saying I know a lot of people, I do physically know a lot of people who say that they're Christians but they never go to church. Now you can say, well now you're being legalistic. No, I just believe if you, if you love the Lord you're going to go to church. I do, I just believe that. I like, being, I like being with other saints. I know a lot of you guys, and I've only been in this church. I've never been in this building. I, I preached a long time ago at the old building, but I've not ever been in the new building. And so, and even though I'm not a member here, uh, and I don't know all of you guys, I, I still am loving being here this morning. Why? Because I'm gathered with God's people. That's good stuff. And, but the thing is, I know people that say they're Christians, they never go to church, they don't act any different than they've ever acted. They do a lot of things that just flies in the face of God. And, and, and I'm thinking either you don't have what you think you have or you're just flat out not living for Him. I'm not sure which one. But church, if we really did act like believers in Jesus Christ, we would transform our community. What if everybody sitting in this room this morning, I don't know how many people is normally supposed to be here. I don't know if half of them laid, laid out because Brother Ray's gone. I don't know. Is that true? No, I'm kidding. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. Okay. Yeah. I was, I just wanted to see if anybody was shaking their head. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. There might be supposed to be twice as many people here this morning. It don't matter. Okay. Uh, I, I got the ones that are here. That's all that matters. I'm just thankful you showed up. Okay. But what if everybody in this room, and I'm starting with me. Okay. Starting with me. I'm not saying what if you guys did. No, I'm saying me. But what if we just fell in love with Jesus Christ this morning? I mean, what if we just, I'm, I'm serious about that now, okay? What if we fell in love with Jesus Christ? And I'll use my wife for an example. We, we just celebrated 30 years of marriage the other day. She has been blessed for 30 years. Um, I'm just kidding. But you know what? You know when our marriage is at its best is when I don't love her for what she can do for me. Now, let that sink in just for a minute. Well, I love her because she washes my clothes. I love her because she fixes me food. I love her for whatever reason, okay? But what if I loved her because she's my wife? And I'm in a relationship with her. Whether she ever cooked another meal or ever washed another clothes, piece of clothing. What if I just loved her because she's just my wife? And what if the, she loved me the same way? I know I'm awesome, but what if she loved me in spite of me being awesome? Wouldn't our relationship be so much better? Yes. Yeah, because that's called unconditional love. Yes. However, Jesus loves us unconditionally, but we oftentimes love Jesus for what he can do for us. 
We use him like a fire extinguisher. We don't pull him out of the closet until we need something. And then as long as my life is running fine, I think I've got it. I put it on cruise control and we go until my life goes off into a ditch. And then I go, Lord, I need you to bail me out. Listen, that's not the relationship Jesus saved us for. Jesus saved us to walk with him every day. If my life is in the ditch, I praise him. If my life is on a mountaintop, I praise him. Why? Because he's my savior and he's worthy of my praise. If he stopped blessing today and I got a terminal illness and I died in six months, for the next six months I should praise him. Why? Because he's not let me down, not one time in my life. He is worthy. So when I say, what if we fell in love with Jesus this morning? That's what I mean. If this church right here, you and I, if we just fell in love with Jesus Christ and said, God, I am going to praise you. I'm going to be relentless about my walk with you. I'm going to read my Bible every day, not so I can check a box and brag at church and say, I've read through the book of Matthew. No, what if I read my Bible? Because, God, I want to know more about you. God, I want to know more about you. I want to learn about you. I want to, to have a deep walk with you. God, I'm going to talk to you every day. Again, not so I can check a box and say, I pray. But God, I really want to know what you have to say about my life. I want you to be a part of my life. And God, I, don't want, I want me and you to be closer than anybody else. And if we had that mentality this morning, if you fell in love with Jesus and I fell in love with Jesus, before long, people would be talking about you down at the dollar store and saying, man, what is going on at that church down there? All I'm hearing about is people being saved and getting baptized, joining the church. They're having to tear down their building and build a bigger one because it won't hold them all. They're running three services now. Well, Brother Ray would love to preach three services. So anyway, so, but if we fell in love with Jesus Christ, because listen, the community's full of people that need to hear about Jesus Christ. And he called us to reach a lost world. But it starts with you and I. It starts with you and I. So this morning, as we get ready to have our invitation, go back to the title of our sermon as our musicians and our, uh, the brothers going to stand in front of the church this morning and represent the church. My title was this, Death to Life. Is your life impacting others? Now, I'm going to say this. Is your life impacting others? Believe it or not, it is. It's just sometimes it ain't for the good. Sometimes it's for the bad. We're making an impact, good or bad. Good or bad. Every day. But let's make a point to impact this community with Jesus. Let's let Jesus shine through our lives. May, may Jesus be what people see when they look at me and not me. Because I'm telling you, I can get all in God's way sometimes. I get in God's way a lot. Okay? A lot. And I have to constantly come back to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I messed that up again. I messed it up again. And you may be in that situation this morning. Maybe you just need to come to God and say, hey, God, forgive me, but I made this all about me. It's never been about me. It's all about you. I say this a lot, and I believe it. I believe when I get to heaven one day, one day I'm going to realize just how much about Jesus it really was about. But boy, I like to make it about Vance. We are self-centered people, aren't we? but it is about Jesus. So this morning, as we get ready to have our invitation, ask God what he sees when he looks at you. Be prepared for the answer. And when he tells you, be willing to make that change. Let's pray this morning. Father God, Lord, I love you. And I'm so thankful, God, that I got a chance to stand and brag on you this morning. God, for what you've done in my life. And I'm also thankful, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Lord, I'm so thankful of how you... Love me unconditionally. I'm also thankful, Lord, at how you put up with a knucklehead like me. And God, I, I just, again, Lord, when you look at me this morning, God, what do you see? God, sometimes I, I get this opinion of myself, and I think I'm right where I need to be at, and, and I may not be. But God, this morning, when you look at me, is there anything, God, I need to work on? And I know there is. I just want you to show me, and I want you to tell me. And Lord, I want you to forgive me of any mistakes that I have made today in this moment. Lord, so that I don't make them again. Lord, help me to grow closer to you. God, I pray that you would give me a hunger for your word and for spending time with you, God, like I have a hunger for all the other things of this life. Lord, I pray that you would be the number one thing in my life, Lord, and that I would get up in the morning thinking about you and I'd go to bed thinking about you. And, Lord, I just pray that you will just bless this invitational time. Lord, I pray that decisions will be made this morning that would honor you. 
And I pray for Brother Ray this morning and Miss Cheryl, and I pray, God, that when they come back this afternoon, God, or whenever they're coming back, God, that you'll bless them with safe travels home, and you'll bless them in their ministry here. And we pray all this today in Jesus' name. Amen. come to the altar. Can we sing this together? Jesus, we love you. Old things have passed away. Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace Remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again, and you cause your sun to shine on darkest night. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one, our, our heart. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our, our hearts
Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm